When the mountains turn from white to gray to black, that's when we know the world is going to come to an end. This is a story that I heard as I was in the rural part of the Himalayas about seven years ago. This is a story that's passed down from generation to generation. And the grandparents who were telling the story said that in the past 50 years, during part of the year, the mountains in the distance turned from white to gray. They saw this as a sign. And for me, this was the first time that the elusive idea of climate change was brought into focus and brought into context. You could see that how the grasslands were turning from grass to desert, and the forests were no longer a 20-minute walk away, but instead a 30, 40, 50-minute walk away. At the time, though, I was um, still, actually, that was my uh, summer after my freshman year. I was studying engineering at MIT. Most of my friends and colleagues were pursuing internships on Wall Street and looking to work at big corporations. But it was that moment that I knew that I wanted to do something about this. I had grown up in Utah and Wyoming in the western part of the US, which strangely enough looked very similar to this high altitude part of the Himalayas. But I didn't know what it was that I wanted to do or what I could do. And so that's when I started to ask questions of the communities that I was uh, becoming friends with and who were um, welcoming me in as a guest. And what they said was that they had a lot of ideas, but that to this day, donors who had come in or people from the outside were bringing two things. They were bringing ideas from the city and concepts from far away, or they were bringing products and services that weren't matched for the local lifestyle and the needs of the communities. And that no one was listening to them and no one was coming back and being dependable as, as was promised in the offers of original help. And so that's, when I returned that summer to MIT, I thought, there actually aren't too many things as a student that I could probably do, except maybe there's some resources that could be pulled together. Or maybe there are people who have ideas that could be contributed to bring what the communities want to fruition. And so that was the initial premise. And actually, we had the common problem of any young organization of not clearly defining what our mission, how it is we were going to work, or particularly what focus we were going to have. Also, during that next year, I spoke to my advisor about some of these experiences. And he had said, you should be getting a job at Google. You should be going to Wall Street just like everyone else. And that's where your career can take you. And that's what's going to provide for your future. But for me, inside, I knew that that wasn't quite the right answer. I had this gut feeling that that wouldn't be where my future lay. And so against his advice, because he said I would never graduate if I did, but I took a year off. And I went back to that same community and spent that entire year with, with them, migrating from, um, from, from one place to another. And I think that's, that was really the beginning of that turning point in, in that journey. And as I went back to school, I looked for what classes could help me to figure out more about better understanding the context and how we can better bring resources together. So despite what I said about that beginning story of people seeing that this is where the, the sign of the end is coming, I think actually there's an incredible amount of hope, opportunity, and eventually I think that we will have success in addressing these great challenges around climate change and energy. I think that what it requires is a locally developed solution that has global applications. I think that the people who are in the context where that challenge is are the ones who are best equipped to solve those challenges and come up with a sustainable solution. As one example, the product that we've created, which uses the sun to provide cooking, is something that now 
we've been selling on the market for, for one year, so still a short time. But in our evaluation of how the product has been used, we've seen that it's been able to reduce up to 70% of the fuel used in each family's home and also reduce indoor air pollution by 70%. Indoor air pollution caused by the stoves inside of the homes is actually the biggest killer of children in the developing world. And I think many of us are probably familiar with that. China in particular has the greatest burden of disease. More than 500,000 people die each year due to the smoke produced by the stove inside of their home. And on top of that, I think we've all been experiencing the air quality outside of this hotel. And we've seen, I think many of us, the numbers reaching above 500 in Shanghai just in the past few days. From the research we've conducted, working with the local community who actually, they're the ones carrying out the research looking at the exposure to this indoor air pollution, they found that the air quality in those rural homes, the average rural home in, in China, is 10 times worse than the air quality in Beijing or in Shanghai. And it's a massive difference because people are, and particularly women and children, are spending almost all of their day inside of that home. And so I think that, again, we see that as an opportunity. People are well educated about the needs in their own community and now I think it's about building the, rebuilding the confidence that people can develop their own sustainable solutions for a future. Particularly these communities in the Himalayas have been, have been thriving there and maintaining that sustainability for hundreds of years. Now I think it's reinvigorating that traditional lineage of innovation. Thank you.